In this video, we're going to start discussing about stresses on folds and fractures. Before we get started on to calculating stresses on folds and fractures, let's first review what are folds and what are the geometrical characteristics that are going to help us to calculate those stresses on folds and on fractures. First of all, what is a fold? I'm going to click over here. A fault is going to be a discontinuity in a rock mass. So this first figure that is the one I'm going to show in a little bit. But here we have two examples of two faults, where there are two parts of a geological sequence which is cut through a fracture. And this fracture is going to happen, for the case of faults, in a shear mode. So you can see that there is a relative displacement from one part of the geological sequence with respect to the other. Usually the rock which is underneath the fault is called the foot wall and the part which is over the fault it is called the hanging wall. So in this case we see that the hanging wall is moving down with respect to the foot wall. Now, why do these faults happen in nature? Probably you can recognize this type of failure or relative movement of one part with respect to each other at a given angle as a shear fracture. And faults are just shear fractures. Over time, we see that due to the action of tectonic strains, either in an extensional environment or in a contracting environment or compressing environment such as this one, due to the action of the stresses, we can have the rock to fail in shear and to form a fracture that eventually is going to form a fault. The orientation of such fault is going to depend on the orientation of the stresses and the orientation of the principal stresses and the state of the stress, either if it's normal strike sleep or reverse. In this example over here, I show the schematics for the formation of a reverse or thrust fault in which the hanging wall goes over and moves up with respect to the foot wall. We'll come back to the formation of these type of faults after we see the basic parameters and geometry that are going to help us to refer to the orientations of these faults with a little bit more of uh, rigor. All right, so here I was showing uh, two examples of, uh, of two faults, and uh, you should imagine this as three-dimensional structures, where we can see that there is a parameter that we can see right away from these faults, which is the an angle, an inclination angle, and you can see that in this fault or you can see it in this other fault. And that's one of the parameters that we're going to quantify. This parameter, uh, we're going to see that is called the dip. And another parameter that we're going to see, it is the one called uh, strike. All right, so before we move into those geometrical definitions, let's just appreciate a little bit more the, the pictures over here. And this picture on the right particularly, it's a fault which is located next to a major fault in which the displacement between the hanging wall and the foot wall is of uh, several hundred feet. And, and here we do not see that fault. It wouldn't be that easy to, to take a picture of this one and to appreciate as nicely as we see this one. But let me just uh, go, uh, if you go into this link, you're going to bump into uh, this image over here, where this fault is located in the state of Utah, uh, right by a highway, and it is in front of Arches National Park. Uh, if you go to Utah, close. Uh, if you drive down this road, you go to the city of Moab, and uh, this is Arches National Park, and along these highway you have what is called the Moab Fault and on the hanging wall of the Moab Fault 
you have also some minor faults across, like for example uh, this one, which is uh, very nicely seen in this uh, rock cut uh, when this highway was done. All right, so what we can see from here is one of the major characteristics of a fault, which is the deep, or how deeply it, it is uh, with respect to the horizontal plane. Another characteristic that it's very important of faults, it's about, if we imagine this as a plane in three dimensions, it's also what is its direction from the horizontal point of view. And to help uh, see that, let's look at this map. Uh, if you go into this link, and uh, you are going to be able to see all the rock units in the state of Texas. Let me close this. And if you click over here in faults, also you're going to be able to map all the floors, all the faults on outgroups of the state of Texas. So here in this map now, we cannot see the deep of the fault itself but we do see what is its orientation on the horizontal direction. And this is going to be quantified by something which is called the strike. For example, if we get uh, close to Austin, where our uh, University of Texas it is located, we see that there are many faults that run in direction southwest, northeast. And this is the other parameter that characterizes the fault and which is called strike. All right, so let's see the definition of those. Now that you uh, have seen what these faults look like, and remember they are like three-dimensional planes. Let me close this one, uh, I'll close uh, this one too. And let me go over here and we'll go into the next topic. And this is, uh, we're, we're going to talk about mapping of faults and fractures. All right, so as we saw in the map before, we will, we're looking at the, at the top view of uh, faults in, the, in Texas. Here we have another example about a cross-section of faults in the subsurface. On surface, we can look at faults, like for example, these ones, but many times the faults that we are interested in are in the subsurface, and here you have a cross section. The way that we can map these faults is through seismic technology, in which here I have a two dimensional cross section, but you could also imagine this volume in a three dimensional seismic uh, survey where we could have several slices of the subsurface and you could see these faults in three dimensions. So, very clearly, clearly uh, very clearly here. The faults are these discontinuities that separates the rock layers uh, in which there has been a, a displacement uh, with respect from the, the foot wall from the hanging wall. And here you can see several, uh, very clearly uh, several faults in the uh, same uh, basin. So we can map these faults in the field through seismic, uh, but uh, if we if you want to get a little bit more of detail about mapping also uh, fractures that may be below the resolution of seismic, what you should do is to use uh, wellbore tools in which uh, you can run a, a logging tool, which is called a formation imager that may be based either on ultrasonic velocity or on resistivity that allows you to observe fractures in the subsurface due to anomalies either of ultrasonic velocity or of resistivity. You can put these images into a reconstructed version or a 3D rep representation and map in that way what are the orientations of fractures. For example, uh, in this case we see this anomaly that looks like a sinusoid and in this case uh, this is a fracture when you reconstruct this into three dimensions, uh, notice that, for example, here the top is in the direction of the east and the bottom is on the direction of the west. When you reconstruct that into three dimensions, uh, you can see what is the orientation of these, uh, in this case, 
it's a fracture intersecting a well. And for that, uh, that orientation in three dimensions, we're going to characterize it with uh, two numbers, which are the strike and the dip, we'll just see in a minute. Just one more example over here. Uh, this is a 3D representation of a formation with its uh, faults, which is uh, critical also for doing a reservoir simulation and understanding what is effects of faults on the state of stress of reservoirs that either are going to be, for example, hydraulically fractured or that could be subjected to depletion and such depletion may alter the state of stress. And here you can also see that some of these faults, uh, sometimes we assume those as planes, but in reality these are uh, three-dimensional uh, surfaces. All right, so before we get into a, a model like this one, let's start from the beginning and try to characterize the orientation of faults. And for that, we're going to use, uh, assume that the faults are just perfect planes and there are going to be two angles that are going to help us determine the orientation of any horizontal plane in three dimensions. And for that, also, we're going to use this geographical coordinate system where the north is the first axis, the east is the second axis, and the depth is the third axis. This coordinate system respects what is called a, the right-hand rule in which the north is going to be your index finger, the east is going to be your middle finger of your right hand, and the depth is going to be your thumb. So you may want to check that on your own, and you will see that if you follow this rule with your right hand, uh, you should uh, match what I have in this figure. All right, with this geographical coordinate system, now we can map exactly the orientation of any plane in three dimensions. And for example, in this case, Let's say that the plane of our fault is this plane in red. The first thing I'm going to do is to define what is called the strike angle. And it's going to be this angle uh, phi, which is going to be the angle between the north, the angle of uh, the line of the north, which is the same line as this axis, and the strike line, where the strike line is the intersection of the fault with a horizontal plane. The intersection of any two planes give us a line and the intersection between a horizontal plane and the fault plane is a strike line. The angle between the north and the strike line is what, uh, what we call uh, simple, uh, simply as just strike or strike angle. All right, uh, notice that still uh, if you imagine this to be a hinge, we still have one degree of freedom because along this hinge or around this hinge, this plane could have any angle. So the second angle to define is going to be the dip. And the dip delta is going to be the angle between a horizontal plane and the plane of the fault. And we usually measure this angle uh, from the horizontal plane towards the direction of a plane. And this is going to be that angle delta. All right. It's very important to notice that this angle delta or the angle of dip is the maximum angle possible between the plane and the, the plane of the fault and the horizontal plane. And... Uh, uh, that's important because uh, this is the angle of the dip which is going to uniquely characterize that dip angle and in order to, to understand a little bit better uh, this angle uh, you could also imagine the line of dip and the line of dip is going to be the line that for example is the steepest line on the plane 
And for example, you could drop a droplet of water right here and the water will follow gravity and will follow the steepest direction, which is going to be this one. And that's the steepest line on the fault plane. And that's exactly the line, the orientation that should be used to measure the deep angle. All right, so one more time, the deep angle is going to be the angle between the horizontal plane and the plane of the fault on the line or on the steepest line on that a deep direction and that's just going to be one angle with those two angles we can fully define the orientation of a plane so let's take let's talk a little bit about uh, conventions for the strike angle usually when we go to the field and when uh, especially geologists go to the field measure these angles of strike and dip with respect to the geographical orientation for example, in this case, we could say that the strike is 30 degrees from the north towards the east. And for the angle of the dip, we could say also that the dip is, for example, here about 50 degrees in direction of southeast, or that this plane is dipping or getting deeper in direction southeast. We're going to see that there is another type of convention for, uh, for the strike, which is uh, used mostly for uh, doing uh, uh, mathematical operations, uh, which is going to be uh, what is called the, the azimuth convention. This convention that we see over here is called the quadrant uh, convention, in which we refer to the angles from one of the... Uh, orientations of the geographical coordinate system could be north could be the east could be the west or could be the south and this is usually easier to do in the field because you could stand there on top of a fault and with your compass just look at the orientation of the fault and get that number right away the other convention that we're going to use is called the azimuth convention so we have already seen the, the quadrant uh, convention. The second one that we're going to see is the azimuth convention in which we refer to the strike as the angle measured clockwise from the north towards the line of strike. So for example, here I could measure for looking from the top and looking just as the strike line, I could measure the strike angle as with the quadrant convention and 45 here from the north 45 degrees towards the east which is going to be this fault over here or I could also say uh, from the south 45 degrees towards the west this is going to be the same strike line and if I were to use the azimuth convention, I would go over here by measuring the angle. Let me zoom in a little bit more. In clockwise, clockwise direction from the north as 45 degrees, this would be uh, this particular strike line. Or I could go all the way over here and measure always clockwise from the north 225 degrees, which is going to be the strike of that line so those two angles they point towards the same strike line uh, we're going to see later on that these are uh, slightly different and in the, they depend on the dip of each particular fault but let's not get in those uh, details uh, right now okay so for now what I like that, uh, that you get from here is that uh, there are two parameters in order to fully define a plane in three dimensions. And these are the strike and dip. And in this convention, uh, in order to map these faults with respect to a geographical coordinate system, then we use the direction of the north and also we use the horizontal plane in order to define these two angles. All right, so now that we know what strike and dip are, 
many times uh, it's going to be very useful to map some of these faults uh, for a, a given region in a single plot. Uh, for example, let me come back uh, over here to the map of the faults uh, near the, this is actually called the, the Volcanes Fault, and uh, this is, as I was telling you before, very close to Austin. Many of you live on the region of the of the Balcones uh, Fault, and for example, we may want to map the strike and dip of all of these faults in this region into a single map in order to understand and to quantify statistically what is the orientation of these faults. In order to do that, uh, a very helpful tool is the Stereonet, in which in the Stereonet uh, map, what we do is we map strike and dip of faults into this semi uh, semispherical projection that allow us to map a three-dimensional plane as just one point. All right, and, and let me walk you through the logic of this. But remember, the, our application is going to be to map several folds into just one plot. All right, the Stereonet is based on taking advantage of the line perpendicular to a plane. Any plane has just one perpendicular line. And for example, in this plane, this perpendicular line, if we consider this a fault, uh, which is, uh, for example, this one, it's about 30 degrees from the north towards the east. This is the line of a strike. And this one, I hope you can see this in three dimension that is dipping towards the northwest and therefore if I draw a perpendicular line to that plane it's going to go into the direction in this case southeast this is what is called the pole of the fracture and it's going to intercept a semi-spherical uh, projection on this point over here and the intersection of the plane with the semi uh, hemisphere or semi sphere is going to be this line over here. All right, what I want to get to is that instead of just seeing the entire plane or the entire intersection of the entire uh, plane, Stereo Next take advantage of this just to plot this point. And this point, if we look at that from the top, we will see it, for example, right here, where the strike line is going to be, for example, this line, and the point over here is going to tell me uh, what is the intersection of a line perpendicular to the plane projected onto this uh, lower hemisphere, and that's going to tell me what the strike of the fault is and what also the dip of the fault is. So let's see an example about this, an interactive example. If you go and click into this link that I have over here, uh, you're going to bump into this app that it's in a StereoNet uh, app, interactive app, that allow us to uh, plot and to make these StereoNets by double clicking on this one. All right, so I'm gonna close this and let me zoom in a little bit over here. So uh, remember that this is the north and this is, of course, the south, the east, and the west. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot here a similar cloud to the one I see over here. And we're going to make this also similar to the faults in the in the Balcones fault. All right. Uh, as I move the mouse, you can see that 
I'm moving the mouse around the pole and the line that you see on the other side is the intersection of the fault plane with this lower uh, sphere projection. So for example, uh, if I were to click, uh, double click right here, I would already make a fault. And let's go to the 3D version of this. And this is what I get. You see, my pole is over here. Uh, this represents actually the strike and dip of this fault I had over here. Let me come back to the to the 2D and I am gonna make two other clicks just to visualize the effect of the position of the pole in this stereo net. So I come back to 2D and if the pole, for example, is close to the uh, is close to the to this outer region or this outer sphere, that means that the fault is going to be steeper and let me click over here and I'm also going to click very close to the center and close to the center that means it's going to get closer to a horizontal plane so let's go to the 3d view and now you can see these three faults this one over here has its pole over there the one in the middle has a pole somewhere over here and the one uh, which is about horizontal has a, has a pole over there. Remember that all of these poles are lines perpendicular to those planes. And let me come back to the 3D, uh, to the 2D, and also here to my map. What that means is that the position of the pole, uh, how far it is from the center, is going to tell me what is the dip of the fault and the location around this stereo net is going to tell me the strike right for example and let's now play with the strike uh, let me come back over here to this one and uh, let me delete these three faults uh, let's play with the strike and we're going to have for example three faults that are about 45 degrees with different strike you see this one uh, has a strike which is about zero then we're going to have another one with a strike about 45 degrees and another one with a strike about 90 degrees so they are more or less all of them at the same distance from the center Let's go to the 3D the view, and now you can see very clearly that the yellow one has a strike of about zero, but the pole is at 90 degrees. The blue one has a strike of about 45 degrees, but the pole is at 90 plus 45 degrees. And the green one has a strike of about 90 degrees, but the pole is actually at this location and here you can see also the the values of strike and dip the dip you can see it's about 45 degrees in this case the strike is uh, 180 degrees plus the angle that we measure towards the pole i'm going to mention that later on but that uh, requires another definition about uh, about the line of uh, of a strike but notice that this this angle is a strike and it is for example for the yellow one 180 degrees for the blue one is 225 and for the green one is 270 always measure clockwise from the north towards the line of a strike which in this case is this one okay so we were saying that uh, we use these stereo nets because in that way we can map the orientations of faults in a single plot that are going to help us later to see if for example those faults are close to shear reactivation or not and again uh, this map is usually done to represent an area uh, 
like for example this one or some other times to plot the orientation of fractures for example along a wellbore all right uh, let me see if I forget anything from here um, I, I don't think so uh, so I certainly recommend that you play with this uh, app in order to understand a little bit better what stereo nets are um, we'll come back to this later on on how we use these uh, stereo nets for geomechanics all right uh, now uh, the stereo nets are useful to map faults for a, a, a given area but uh, some other times we really want to know where those faults are and what they mean uh, for a given formation and in order to do that we use a geological maps of a given formation for example uh, let's imagine this sand in three dimensions it's a three-dimensional plane and we're just looking at the sand and we want to map this sand because this sand is actually a reservoir unit so instead of doing this in three dimensions what we can do is to, to convert this plot into two dimensions and to make it a contour map where we just look from the top and we have the depths uh, to the top of the formation for example for this particular case this formation is getting deeper in direction southwest and that's what we see also with the contour lines that is getting deeper in direction southwest all right, but what about now if I have a fault in that sand? How can I visualize that into this 2D uh, map? The way to do that is to use these lines that represent a fault. And this is what geologists do uh, when you have a discontinuity in a formation and that uh, represents a fault. Uh, we use and geologists use these lines that represent the fault and the thickness of that line for example for a normal fault is going to tell you how far apart these formations are in the horizontal direction and a little bit a, this thick on that line is going to tell you in which direction the fault is dipping for example, for this particular case, this fault has a strike which is more or less 45 degrees from the north uh, towards the east and is dipping in direction southeast. This is what that means. And in the case that we had the reverse fault, it's a little bit different. Uh, in the case of the reverse fault, uh, okay, um, this is the case of still of a normal fault as you go uh, in um, as, as the displacement between the two layers increases the horizontal distance between the layers increases that's what is called the heave and uh, when you look from the top it looks like there is nothing but but actually uh, there is rock in there it's just that it's not the, res the same reservoir unit and that heave is what you see here as the thickness of this line in thrust faults opposite uh, you have the opposite actually the formations when you look from the top overlap on, on each other and instead of plotting this as a continuous line usually uh, what geologists do is to plot this with these dents that uh, tell you uh, that this is a, a reverse fault all right, so let's see an example about these uh, normal faults and how we map those in geological maps. Here you have an example of the North Sea, uh, where this is Norway, and, and here this is Scotland. Uh, here we have the North Sea, a very uh, prolific sedimentary uh, formation for hydrocarbons. And what we see is the lines of the strike of faults and also the ticks which are telling you in which direction these faults are dipping and for example you could take a, a cross section near 
near uh, here this top part like here AA or B and just by looking at the map you should be able to tell me in which direction these uh, faults are dipping for example let's look at this region over here this fault is uh, uh, dipping towards the northeast and this fault is also dipping to it's uh, it has a strike which is more or less similar to that one but is dipping towards the west so if this one is dipping towards the east and this one is dipping towards the west what that means that this region is what is called a graven and it is at a, a bigger or a larger depth than the adjacent formations so in order to try to understand a little bit better what's going on here let's come back to our seismic section and if we were to take a cross section uh, you will see something similar uh, to what we have in this region uh, where here we can see the dip very well, but we cannot see uh, the strike. And there are going to be regions in which, in this section, that are going to have these opposing dips, like for example this one over here, in which this section is going to be at a lower uh, depth, or uh, that we, I should actually say, at a higher depth than the adjacent formations, and this is what we have seen in the map to be a graven. We're going to see later on that in nature we also have this type of formations which uh, they have about the same dip. Uh, uh, it's opposing though in the different directions, uh, dip in different directions but with the same angle and with the same strike. And these are, these are what are called conjugate faults. Okay, so by now uh, we have seen that uh, we can now map faults we, we know what is the strike, we know what is the dip for example here we have the dip direction, we don't have the dip angle but you could add that if you wanted to these maps and uh, this helps us to map uh, faults in three dimensions and these two parameters strike and dip we can also summarize them in stereo nets, something that we're going to do uh, later on in order to understand this from the point of view of geomechanics and eventually to build the models that we're going to use in order to predict if some of these faults and fractures may be reactivated in shear or not.